Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, or whenever you happen to be listening to this. Welcome to the Film Realist Podcast, the film and TV podcast from a complete nobody that's hopefully for somebody. I'm your host, Kyle Naranya, and as we get down to the end of 2022, there's going to be less episodes because realistically, there's only really one week left. But today's episode will be a review of Avatar The Way of Water, the 13-year long-awaited sequel to the highest grossing film of all time, Unadjusted Box Office. I look forward to reviewing that in a non-spoiler and a spoilery section of the review. No need to worry, time codes will be in the description, so if you do want to hop around, you will be able to. And at the end of the episode, you will find out how I'm going to end the year and what to look forward in 2023. It's insane to me that we're going to be in 2023. So without further ado, let's get into the non-spoiler general thoughts on Avatar The Way of Water. Avatar The Way of Water was of course directed by James Cameron and screenplay was written by James Cameron, Rick Jaffa, and Amanda Silver. That writing couple would be known best for their work on the first two of the rebooted Planet of the Apes trilogy, as well as the first Jurassic World, Mulan, and the upcoming sequel to the Planet of Reboot, Planet of the Apes trilogy, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, which will be directed by Wes Ball. Now, I should probably preface this by talking about how I felt about the original film. I was fortunate enough to see it in theaters and was absolutely blown away by the special effects. The 3D integration into that film was absolutely stunning and clearly set the precedent moving forward for 3D films move that continued after that. There was that brief period of everything had to be in 3D, which was annoying, I would say, to some degree because uh, there were a significant amount of films that failed to reach the level of Avatar, which is not something that would be hard to do given that how long the film was in development, the use of Weta's breathtaking special effects and clearly it worked because it was able to gross 2.923 billion dollars in 2009 now obviously the film has been released multiple times to get to that number but regardless highest grossing of film of all time doesn't happen by accident needless and there was a lot of hype i don't want to say needless to say again but i'm just going to keep this in because i'm a real person and i do make mistakes often depending on who you ask (laughs) i thought that the Trailers for Avatar The Way of Water looked absolutely spectacular in the film. This is, or in the theater, this is a film that lives or dies by its theatrical experience. That was why it was so wildly successful the first time. And the marketing for this film, I thought was really well done in the theater, building the hype for, look, it's more Avatar. And for a lot, clearly a lot of people, they were very excited about going back to Pandora. I did not think the first film outside of the special effects was very good. I think it was fine, if not an average blockbuster that did not create compelling characters that I wasn't really interested in seeing again. It's interesting that Zoe Saldana has been in two of the highest grossing films of all time, of course, with Avatar 1 and Avengers Endgame. But I had hesitant expectations for this because I was the level of investment was not significantly high. And knowing that the film was three hours and 10 minutes, which is long for any blockbuster, it does feel that blockbusters are getting longer and longer. There obviously were complaints about the runtime of Avengers Endgame. I would argue, given the fact that that was the finale of the Infinity War saga, which started in 2008, ending in 2019, may have justified that length. But if you really wanted to, me to explain what I think could have been cut. I can give you some cuts. Obviously, the runtime of the Batman was significantly long at almost three hours. Zack Snyder's Justice League being four. Now, that being a streaming film, you can pause whenever you want, and it was broken up into chapters. I do think that the length of this film hurts it. I found it really interesting, especially given the fact, and now learning this honestly as I'm recording, that Rick Jeff and Amanda Silver contributed to this script that Rise of the Planet of the Apes and Dawn of the Planet of the Apes are really well, tight, compact, well thought out blockbusters with runtimes just over two hours. Now, obviously, that has to do with the fact that Matt Reeves was involved as well as Mark Baumbach, but I think this film is bloated in length. It does not need to be three hours and 10 minutes. There is a lot that sets up potential 
or sequels moving forward we know we're getting avatars three four and five the exploration of the sea and the water effects in this film are incredible the thing that i'm going to continually play praise in this review is that these are the greatest special effects ever put to a film and that's coming from somebody who is not a huge fan of this franchise and with the um, motion capture that is at play here the water that i had to continually tell myself is not real outside of a couple humans Nothing in this world exists, and that is an absolutely jaw-dropping achievement that the level of fidelity and the systems that Weta, as well as the other special effects companies that are current, that did work on the film, put in place for this is absolutely, it's breathtaking to see what, what they were able to achieve in, I believe is about four years, given the, the overall production of the film and how long the effects were in the pipeline i think that james cameron's obsession with the water is clear here given with the abyss titanic that you are exploring a new aspect of pandora which is really cool getting to see the forest tribe which was the one that natiri was a part of and now getting to see the water what is this the the navi my brain is mush right now, and I apologize. As a, Obviously, if you're listening to this as it went live, I recorded this three days before Christmas. If you do celebrate Christmas, I know that Hanukkah started on Sunday. Happy Hanukkah. That it is really interesting to get to see the different cultures within the world of Avatar. Now, I know that could seem like a really compelling storyline, and it, it the movie does have a lot of fun with it, but we did get to see other forest tribes within the film, and most of this is spent with a specific water tribe that Jake Sully and his family visit. He does. He is a father in this film. I do not believe that's overall spoiler. I think that making Jake Sully and Natiri parents adds a dimension to the characters and a motivation that I was able to connect to specifically, partially because I am a father, but Jake Sully in the first film is an idiot. And while that seemed to be compelling for some i did not find him interesting quite frankly the only reason i remembered his name was because when i think about the film the first film in my head i hear zoe saldana's accent saying his name otherwise i would not have been able to tell you just like i wouldn't be able to tell you what the the full names of the characters are in the jurassic world franchise i did enjoy the film as a spectacle it is certainly that and is a like i said it's incredible to look at the 3d however I honestly thought it was better in the first film. I did not feel as captivated by it in this. The the environment that Weta's team and James Cameron was able to visualize is really, really great. And you do feel that real depth. But while the underwater effects are absolutely spectacular, I think you lose a little bit, a little bit of that depth when you are underwater. And you don't know where it's supposed to end. It is this abyss, which is really, really cool and breathtaking. But... I don't know why I felt that the immersion was lesser than the first film. There is a lot going on in this movie. We specifically Jake Silitra is trying to keep his family safe. The humans are back. It's been a significantly long time since the first film as his children are able to grow up. He has two young teenagers and two daughters. I think that this film has too many characters at one point about a third, the, maybe half of the movie had gone by and the film managed to go back to the humans who this is I'm not going to consider this a spoiler I'm if you do think it is then you can let me know but that the humans are back because the story seemed to completely forget about them I think the whimsy of this film kind of got lost on me it is incredible to look at and this is a movie that thoroughly succeeds from the theatrical experience but I think there are too many people there is a human child who's really kind of a young man at this point, following around with Jake Silly's family. There are multiple kids. Some of them, I feel, just kind of get left behind. Maybe they will be focused on more so moving forward. But if this film had just focused on one specific relationship of one of the of Sully's children, I think that would have worked better than having a whole gaggle of kids and some getting some focus, some getting pieces of incomplete stories, which I understand in sequels, you're going to build forward, but that story feels incomplete as opposed to open-ended moving forward. That is the disadvantage of making these things in a, a serious long line. I think about franchises, it's more specifically something like Harry Potter, where each main story did come to an end and there were very minor details that eventually 
uh, were expanded on moving forward. There are things introduced in this movie that they address, but then there is ultimately no conclusion to those. And I think more, it would have worked better if they teased these things. I find that really interesting given how the first film was just over two and a half hours and that this film three hours and 10 minutes i think you can cut 40 minutes of this it really does enjoy the spectacle of it there is one of the children who specifically has a relationship with a sea creature that really did feel kind of free willy as to a degree not to say that james cameron was just stealing from uh, or was heavily inspired by another film but there are characters in this that I have no idea what their names are. There are so many characters in this film as a whole getting to meet all of the Sully children, all of the water based Navi, as well as multiple human characters that are in and out of the film. The focus really is on one character, but ultimately his goal does not seem to make sense to me in that he is deliberately going after one individual when the whole reason the humans were in Pandora the for the first place was to mine for resources, whether that be unobtainium, still a really dumb name, or if they've moved on to other things, which I can get into in spoilers. I think that there is a much tighter version of this movie. It's very comical to me that James Cameron is talking about films that in the upcoming sequels, that nine, six hours, that nothing should be that long. I think if this were addressed in a way where you could actually watch this in chunks, I think that would have really impacted how I feel about the movie. But sitting there for three hours and 10 minutes and just sort of waiting for things to happen, I think that the blockbuster aspect of this is truly there, getting to see jaw-droppingly incredible action sequences. But all, some of the setup, to some degree, also doesn't make sense in terms of where characters are and what they're able to do at that time, it feels like tension just for the sake, as opposed to actually making sense in the plot, which I found a little bit disappointing. I can understand, and it's been seen, how many people were caught up in this experience, but removing myself from it, that is partially the reason I took two days than normal to record this review. I really wanted to think about it, as opposed to just saying, oh, this movie sucks. I can't believe people enjoy it. Because that is not how I feel. I have, I feel that are legitimate gripes with the length and the plot of the film that somewhat could be addressed in a shorter cut. But after that, this is a movie to go to the theaters for. And if that's what you're doing for, I think you're thoroughly going to enjoy it. But when I am trying to enjoy something and just being held down by what I think are very obvious problems that it's unfortunate because I really did want to thoroughly enjoy this and be caught up with the massive swell of positive reviews that were released prior to the film coming out. So that's my general impression of the film. How did you feel about it? Or did you think I spoiled anything in this spo non-spoiler section? I quite frankly don't. If it's in a trailer or a TV clip, it's fair game to talk about in non-spoilers. At least that's how I feel about it. So more specific plot details coming up in the spoiler section of the Avatar Way of Water review. It has been many, many years since the original Avatar in actual timeline, where Jake, Sully, and Atiri are able to have multiple kids, and since they forced the humans away, we see that there is... Honestly, I don't remember the names of their kids. There's older good one middle boy who's trouble a young girl and a daughter who was born of Sigourney Weaver's avatar being her big Pandora Navi that the humans had created for her to explore Pandora which is interesting because you do not learn who the father is I'd be really surprised if that's not a run up further because why else would you introduce it and while talking about her Kiri, I had to look this up because again, I don't know what the heck any of their names are. One of the things about this character that I know they brought in specifically was that there are going to be elements of this character moving forward that are going to be addressed in the sequels. She is a character where she has a deep connection with the mother of Pandora. She can heal its heart. She can hear its heartbeat and she's significantly connected to it. There is a moment in the film where she connects to the underwater version of what would be the internet of the planet, as Sigourney Weaver put it in the first film, and she has a, a seizure. And they say that she can't ever do that again because she would die. And no situation happens again in the film that would 
put her in circumstances that would potentially lead to that. So clearly this is a significant loose thread that they're planning on exploring later. Who? What is her parentage? How is she so connected to the mother uh, internet of Pandora? Don't really know. Uh, we will get to see moving forward. Turns out that Stephen Lang is back as a Pandora Navi that was previously created. He put all his memories in a Nintendo Switch, Nintendo DS game cartridge, and then, but he doesn't know whose death was. So now he's mean, blue, and ready to kill Jake Sully. So here's my big problem with this film. He is just a colonel amongst this massive worldwide like extraterrestrial galactic mission to find a new planet for the humans to live on. And they are wasting resources because this guy wants to kill Jake Sully. We see that Jake is mad about the humans coming back and they spend missions destroying their, their trade routes and taking supplies because they want to obviously force the humans back off the planet, which I understand, but to some degree, we are able to see, not to some degree, in a significant degree, we see throughout the film that over time, the humans are able to set up like an entire city on the planet and are completely unaffected by Jake Sully. There's no plan to go blow it up Star Wars Death Star style. It just sort of exists. But his one mission, just to waste resources to find this one person, I found kind of baffling because he's just out for revenge. And honestly, it does. The film at least doesn't show us the perspective that the other humans are as pissed off about Jake Sully existing as Stephen Lang is. We learn that the human spider, and the only reason I remember that is because it was Spider running around with Jake Sully as kind of like an adopted human kid, is Stephen Lang's son. And there's back and forth about him. Oh, the Navi are not to overly done, but we do see this character. Near the very end, just because Natiri, not again, I don't mean to underplay this, but it's clearly setting seeds that he he didn't care for this guy who's not actually his dad because he says like, biologically, I'm your father, but emotionally, I want blah, 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 blah. It's, it is an interesting dichotomy to see this character play with something that is unlike anything any real human would ever be able to play with unless you had a clone or maybe a twin, I guess. That would be something that could be somewhat similar to that situation, but... That is something, again, that the movie heavily implies moving forward will likely be something we see is that Spider's relationship with, what's his name? Colonel Miles Quaritch. Hard name to remember, and I he's just Stephen Lang in my head. We get to see he's got a, a goon squad of Navi clones. I couldn't tell you what any of their names are. There's just army man, army woman, maybe army them. I'm not really sure. The, the humans, again, we're, we see them very early into the movie. And then they don't appear again for almost at two full hours. It's funny to me to see Cliff Curtis play Tonawari, who is the chief of the Metakayina. So the water-based tribe that... Jake Sully takes his family to for safe refuge. As refugees, this film has a significant refugee storyline, which is an interesting thing to be putting in sci-fi. Science fiction, at its best, has always referenced real-world situations, and this is currently really affecting the world with what's going on in Ukraine, as well as several South American countries trying to get into the United States, as well as Canada, and just escaping what is going on in Ukraine, which is just her... It, the situations that are happening in the world every day are truly sad if you take the time to look into it and can be really affected by this situation. So I, I commend James Cameron for putting something that is so modern and recent present in this film. And we get to see the culture uh, difference between the, the forest Navi as well as the water Navi. And something I wish that the film had touched on was we get to see the, the water, the, met to I, the water navi teach the forest navi how to swim and obviously evolutionary speaking the water navi are over years of biology are designed to do it they've got more fin like tails and they do teach the water navi to learn how to breathe which is something that is possible clearly the actors for this film learned how to shoot underwater tom cruise had that scene in mission impossible rogue nation where he had to hold his water for a significant amount of time like I said in the non-spoiler section of the review, the exploration of the 
coral reefs of Pandora is a sight to behold. It is absolutely spectacular. It's something that is the best 3D of the, of the film, I believe. A lot of the illumination and how they are able to move this mocap effects and performances through the water in such a compelling way is I don't even understand how they did it. I can't wait to see a Corridor Crew Visual Effects Artist Reacts episode to this to really break down how they did this because you could probably write a doctorate on visual effects in how this film was able to develop techniques that we have never seen before. We briefly get to see a couple of the humans from the pre uh, the other film. Jermaine Clement shows up, which I thought was fun, from Flight of the Concords. But we also get to see this water-based portion of the human mission to clear out pandora another thing that is heavily just hey look at this thing we're going to talk about it but then we're not going to bring it up again because i'm assuming it's going to come back later on in the film is that there are these space these pandoran whales that their brain fluid stops aging it's immortality fluid and then that that's it the film the film moves on so they're whaling these things and one of Jake Sully's kids, as I mentioned earlier, befriends this outcast whale who was a member of a pack and had killed humans and therefore he was a deserter and because he had murdered, he is looked negatively upon by the rest of Cliff Curtis's water reef people. I thought that was interesting and clearly one of the main storylines of the film that I think could have been done tighter. We get to see more incredible water swimming and I mentioned earlier that uh, Sigourney Weaver playing her own daughter has an interesting relationship with the family. She does look at Jake Sully and Natiri as her parents. Obviously, she wants answers to who her her family is, but we don't get those answers to that in this. Oh, uh, what else is there? The, uh, other than that, we get to see a couple of other wa other water tribes. I mentioned specifically the ending of the film when people are trapped under a structure that's flipped upside down and i know that we do not see the fa the parents natiri and, and jake silly learning to swim significantly as well as the other children it just how that is all set up and where people are is it's hard to keep track of given we don't know the structure of this ship and it just seems like tension is building and building and building and then ultimately uh baby sigourney weaver is able to save her mom and her sister we do lose the good eldest son which i'm very curious on how that's what toll that's going to weigh on the middle troublesome son moving forward i won't be able to tell you what the name of that child was in terms of the uh, character's name given how there are so many characters kate winslet plays this the wife of cliff curtis who's pregnant and she is very determined in her specific relationship with these people she does not want them to be there and we do get to see some culture clash between the Jake Sully's family, the Forest Navi and the Water Navi, but ultimately they build this positive relationship because of their uh, connection over how they take care of their children and what it means to protect Pandora from the humans. At one point in the finale, we get to see an entire group of the water based Navi ready to go and fight, and then they just disappear. I don't know where they go in terms of the of this fight. It winds up just being a Jake Sully family. Natiri cuts Spider to prove that she'd be willing to kill him to get Stephen Lang to let go of one of their kids. I'm sure that will come up again because he reluctantly seems to return to them even after rescuing Stephen Lang from drowning. And uh, that's kind of it. I uh, There may be stuff I'm forgetting, but honestly, I don't really think I am. We do get to see some minor flashbacks from the first film that I'm fairly certain were shot after the first film to fill in elements of certain characters. Like we get to see uh, Giovanni, Riz Giovanni Ribisi back as that character. And that's Avatar 2. It's a lot I honestly wish I could have seen it in two one and a half hour chunks because even given all the stuff that I was able to spew out in this non-spoiler section, I think that a tighter script for this would have been a definitive film that's better than the first film because there is so much going on in this, which is a really good thing. I, I do feel that way, but because there is so much and almost there isn't a specific focus as where the first film while made fun of for being space Pocahontas or space dances with wolves or sp space fern gully, 
There's simplicity to that storyline where there is there's clearly a lot going on with the humans that we don't really touch on. We don't get to know what happens to the rest of the forest Navi. Or if we did, I missed it and I apologize. But this clearly the focus of this is Jake Sully's family. And there has been some some teases from the writers and producers that maybe the children will be the focus moving forward. And I would like to see that because I think getting to know them would really help, especially if they are the focus of the film. And I would like to see specifically the the daughter of Cliff Curtis who seems to build a connection with Jake Silly's troublesome child, not being Spider or any of the girls, the young, the middle boy, which I, I think would be interesting, and I'm curious to see where this goes moving forward. I would look, I would recommend this film if you are curious about the over, the spectacle that is Avatar, The Way of Water. That is what it's for. See it on the biggest screen, but if you are not interested in the spectacle, it is something, honestly, I think you could wait for. I don't think it's going to work as well, on a streamer, on, on on a TV, on your phone, the way that James Cameron wanted you to see it. But overall, it is a fun spectacle is the word. And like an all-encompassing visual masterpiece to the eyes. But I think it suffers from some fridge logic. And I think that holds it back from being maybe the icon in cinema that the first film was. But... You're allowed to determine that for yourself. This is just how the way I felt about it. If you would like to tweet at the show, you can at Film Realist. That's don't forget there's two E's in Realist or me at Kyle underscore Naranya. That will do it for this review. Now I am going to talk about what I have left moving forward. There will be an episode of Glass Onion, that being a review of film I have seen already, that episode will be on time because it has to be pre-recorded because the usual release day will be Boxing Day. So I will not be able to release it or record it on that day because I will be busy with my family. I have not seen all the movies I want to for the end of the year. Top 10 episode. I'm going to be taking two weeks off in January. That will be the first two weeks of January which I have to look up what they are so I can tell you the dates. January 2023. So the first episode back will be January 7th. Nope, January 16th. So I will be taking two weeks off to recoup. Then I will come with my come back with my end of the year 2022 recap. Things that I may have missed. My top 10. Things like that. So I hope... That this isn't the last episode you're listening to this year because there will be one more with Glass Onion. If not, happy holidays, Merry Christmas. I'll see you next time and next year.